familiar. So sing along when, uh, when you, you get caught into it and you understand where it's going. Uh, but this is a song uh, really just reminding us of the gospel, that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, and is alive forevermore. And he came to save us and rescue us from our sins. So let's sing of God who loved us so much that he sent us his son. Come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all ye sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. Oh, he loved us so much. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms for God. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. The power. He is worthy. Praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. Praise God, praise God from whom all blessings flow. what the Apostle Paul says of what he will boast in, in Galatians 6, 14. But far be it from me to boast or to glory in anything except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Far be it from me to boast except in the cross. This is all we have Brothers and sisters, Harvest Bible Church is the cross of Jesus Christ. That is the gospel. That is the good news to tell to the world. It's offensive. People don't understand why would a God go to the cross, and yet it is our salvation. It is what we're called to boast in. So as we continue to sing, let us boast in this Savior, Jesus. 
who saved us and rescued us from all our sins. Of course, um, this doesn't happen, but I'm looking for my music. <laughs> it's been one of those mornings. It's not in your list. My apologies. Yes, thank you, James. <laughs> we'll boast in the cross, not in not in my organizational skills. <laughs> Praise God. sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness he humbled himself and carried the cross love so amazing love so Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from hell. Messiah, Lord of all, his body, his body the bread, his blood the wine, broken and poured out, all for love, the whole earth trembled, and the veil So amazing, love so amazing, yeah, Jesus Messiah.
at the foot of the cross their salvation by the blood of the pure sacrifice by the body broken for you and for me by the love of our lord jesus christ a father you are to the hopeless strength you are to the weak failures become perfection in you at the foot of the cross we are free singing Oh, Father, we love to sing of your grace. Singing, oh, Father, we love to sing of your grace. To sing out your grace. of his grace. What more can we boast of than the gift he's given us? Let's sing this familiar song, Be Thou My Vision.
you could find someone, turn to them and say welcome and good morning, and may we greet one another.
Would you be seated, please? Please be seated. Wow, is it cold in here. <laughs> what an amazing job you guys have done. Yep. So I'm sure Teardown will take a lot less time than it did to put it up. Welcome to Harvest Bible Church this morning. Uh, we're glad that you're here today. Um, if you don't know what's going on, uh, this week we have a Vacation Bible School, and uh, the theme is the Caribbean. <laughs> so anyhow, so I'm sure that the kids are going to be excited uh, for this week. Uh, there are 105 kids that have signed up. Uh, that's awesome. There are a few openings uh, left. Uh, registration would be open until tomorrow morning. Um, it's for 5 to 11-year-olds. Uh, today we will not be having children's church during the sermon, and we will not have uh, Sunday school during the uh, second hour. So after uh, our closing song, we need to take all of the chairs out of the sanctuary, and we're going to put them in the basement. We've been asked to not take them down the stairs, so that uh, down the steps, we're going to go around the ramp over here. Man, it's hot in here. <laughs> uh, we're going to go around the, the outside of the building so that the decorations down the stairwell are not damaged. Uh, Teardown will be next Friday afternoon, Rachel. Next Friday afternoon, June 10th. Uh, please come and help. And then the chairs would need to be brought back upstairs as well and set up. Uh, today's Feed the Sheep will be either in the back foyer or outside, depending on how chilly and windy it is outside. Uh, let's see, June 18th, we have a reschedule. We had the uh, supposed breakfast and shoot at Rady Dyer's a couple of weeks ago, and we had all of the snow. So June 18th, uh, we're going to redo a pancake breakfast and a shooting. June 18th, this is a men's breakfast, 8 a.m. Uh, we want to thank all of you who have set up this week for Vacation Bible School and also all the teachers. And also wanted to thank uh, all of the people that came out yesterday to help do cleanup on the property, clean up branches, mowing, weed whacking, etc. And uh, also, I'm going to start making announcements every week. We're going to be replacing the windows and the siding for the north building this summer. The windows, uh, siding is already here, but we need the windows first. They're probably a couple of months out. So maybe in August, uh, we're going to uh, tear the old siding off and uh, redo it. So uh, we would love to have all the help we can get. And James has an announcement here. All right, well, um, something that uh, the Lord's laid on my heart, um, for particularly the men of this church, is that we, we used to have a men's Bible study on Wednesday mornings. Uh, maybe some of you guys remember that. It was at 7 a.m., and uh, for about, I don't know, a little over a year now, we haven't had it. And so I want to get that started again. Uh, I want to do it on Tuesday mornings at 6.30 a.m. I know that sounds early, okay, but uh, I know how early some of you guys can get up to go hunting with the buddies. Amen? Amen. 
You can be out there at 4.30 in the morning ready to get that deer, elk, or, you know, whatever you're hunting, or fishing, right? And so you can get up early to come to the church um, and, and do Bible study with the boys, okay? So um, we're not going to start it this week, but the week after VBS, so the following Tuesday after, after this week, um, we're going to kick off the men's Bible study over in the office uh, at 6.30 a.m., and we'll, I'll announce it again next week just to remind you all, but I'd love to have you there. It's a great time to fellowship, great time to uh, just look at the scriptures together, great time to pray for one another and whatever uh, the Lord has providentially got us walking through in our lives these days. And also one more announcement, youth group this week, um, we're going to have a summer kickoff party. There's not going to be teaching. We're just going to have hot dogs and food and some fun games and uh, Lord willing, maybe a fire pit there. So um, if you are in middle school or high school, be sure to come out to uh, youth group this Wednesday night. It starts at 5.30, ends at 8 p.m. is, is the pickup time. And uh, this summer, we're going to keep having youth group all through the summer. We're going to keep finishing up our teaching series in Philippians. We're, we're just getting to the end of chapter 5, or Ephesians, I'm sorry. We're, we're just getting to the end of uh, chapter 5 in Ephesians, and we're going to wrap it up throughout the summer. So it's going to be an exciting time. So be sure, if you are middle school age or high school age, to come on out for youth group this Wednesday. Thank you. At this time, we are going to have the ushers come forth uh, for the offering. The on and off button, it works. I'm not used to this. Uh, would you pray with me for the offering? Lord, we just thank you for all the blessings that you have provided on us, the ones that we see and the ones that we don't see. And we just now come to you and give back just a portion to show our love and adoration for you. We just ask now that you take these offerings and use it for your works to spread your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, good morning, everyone. Looks like we're down to the faithful few this morning. <laughs> Glad you, everyone's here. Uh, at this time, we'll have our pastoral prayer, and if uh, you're willing and able, would you please kneel with me? Oh, holy and righteous, loving and merciful Heavenly Father, we, uh, we come to you this morning, and uh, we enter your courts with praise and thanksgiving, Father. Um, you're such a loving Father, and you bless us so very dearly, Lord. We just uh, we thank you for the recent moisture and what it's doing for the crops and our aquifers, Father. We we thank you for these beautiful spring days and the beautiful sunsets, Father. We thank you for your everyday blessings 
and provisions and favors on our lives. Father, we just uh, we praise you for there is none like you. For you created us and you created the universe. And you suspend the earth from nothing. You, you give the energy to the sun. And you give light to the moon and stars, Father. And you are just, you're the king of kings and the Lord of lords. You are the great I am. You are the ancient of days. You are our deliverer, our redeemer. And we just give you all the glory, the honor, the power, and the praise that's due you, Father. At this time, we, uh, we lift up our church body needs, and you know our needs before we do, Lord. And you know all that needs a touch from you uh, more than I do, Father. And uh, just to name a few, we lift up... Uh, Brian and Harold, who's uh, been touched with COVID, we continue to lift up Dan Hollins for his continued health and improvement. Um, we lift up little ones, uh, Jane Varner and Samuel Anderson and, and little EJ. Lord, we just pray that uh, you would touch and heal these, these young children, Father. We pray for uh, Roy Wingard and those who have uh, upcoming surgeries, Lord, we just pray that uh, you would be present during the operation, that you would guide the medical staff, Lord, that uh, you would bring healing, and, and we pray that the physical therapy would go well, Lord. Father, we lift up Harry Rayner in the Whitlow family, Lord. Uh, we just we pray for miraculous healing on Harry, Lord. Uh, we pray that you would take this uh, cancer from his body as, uh, as well as Renee. Guerrero, Lord, uh, we just lift them up. We pray that you'd be with their families and comfort them as well, Father. Amen. Lord, uh, we also pray about this uh, Roe versus Wade. There seems to be an opportunity for it to be overturned, and we just pray that you give the Supreme Court justices uh, the strength and the courage to follow through, Lord. Uh, we just uh, lift up this nation with the recent uh, violence that's been taking place across this country, and Lord, we just pray that uh, it would come to an end, that uh, your will will be done here on earth as it is in heaven, Father. We just, we pray for revival. Uh, we, we see the fruits of what happens when you're taken out of the classroom and taken out of society, and it's, uh, we just pray that you would reverse that, Father. Lord, we also just, uh, we realize our life is but a vapor. And uh, we ask, Lord, that you would work through us with the time that we have, that you'd uh, have us come alongside others and uh, show your love. You, you tell us that uh, uh, by the love that we show others is how people know that we are your disciples, Lord. So I ask that you strengthen us and equip us uh, to come, um, come alongside each other and to, and to love one another, Lord. And, uh, and we just we we see that the enemy is on the, on the prowl, the enemy of our souls, Lord. And I ask that you would uh, strengthen us and guide us, Lord. Help us to put on the full armor of Christ every day, Lord. Help us to help us to stand in the gap and to do Your will. We ask that you would use us as Your vessels, Father. Just uh, lift up James as he as he gives the message. Lord, I pray that you strengthen and encourage him, that you would speak through him, that you would uh, soften our hearts and minds to receive your message today, that we would, uh, we would be doers of your words and not just listeners, Lord. We just ask all this in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, the church looks great this morning. Thank you to the team who decorated the church. Thank you for the, all the work that went into working outside in the church yesterday, too. I do have to say, um, you know, I haven't seen the whole church yet, but I love that thing, and I love that thing. I, I don't know what it is. I, I think those are my favorite, though. That one might be my favorite. I think that thing is just awesome. So, go ahead and turn in your Bible to Acts 16. Um, we are going to have kids with us, so I do understand if there's a little bit more noise and movement than usual. When Jim, actually, uh, when my wife and I moved out here, 
And Jim installed me as a youth pastor. He brought my, my wife and I before the congregation. Um, he read the qualifications of, of biblical eldership. And um, I, I kid you not, two, the moments collided like I've never seen before. Jim is reading the qualifications of an elder that, that he must manage his household well, keeping his children submissive. And my son is running down the aisle. Ah! And I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> but that's welcome here. You know, they didn't, they didn't discharge me as an elder. So, <laughs> so that is welcome here. If your kids are noisy, active, it's okay. It's okay. So just, just let that free you up. Don't feel like you need to keep them silent. Um, we love children here at Harvest Bible Church. Well, we, we know as Christians, if you've been walking with the Lord, you know that there are certain books of the Bible that the Lord has providentially used in your life more than he's used others, okay? Maybe there's a book of the Bible coming to your mind right now. Well, for me, one of those books that the Lord has used to, to shape my life in a really formative way is the book of Philippians. And so when Jim and I talked a couple weeks ago about doing a series in Philippians this summer, um, you can imagine I was thrilled. And so this morning, we are going to kick off this series in Philippians that we're going to be looking at for the rest of the summer. And I'm excited. I'm really excited because, as I said, the Lord's used this book in my life in some really powerful ways. And I'm excited to see the way the Lord's going to use it to shape our church. But what we're going to do this morning, um, we're not going to actually um, do a message from Philippians this morning. We're going to look at, at how the church of Philippi began. Okay, And so go ahead and turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 16. This is, this is how um, Paul first ended up in the city of Philippi, how the church in Philippi was started. It's an amazing story, really, to see how churches begin. They start small with just a few people receiving Christ, but they grow and they change the city. Now, if you know anything about the city of Philippi, um, it, it, it's, it's Paul's first missionary uh, a movement in Europe, okay? They called Philippi the gateway between Europe and Asia. It's, it's, it's there, it's, uh, you can look at a map in the back of your Bible, which is amazing that we even have maps in the back of our Bibles, but, but it was named Philippi after King Philip II of Macedon, who was the father of Alexander the Great, okay? And, in, and I think about 42 BC, it became a Roman colony rather than one who was uh, under Alexander the Great, and, and the city, it, it's known for being a proud Roman colony in this time, okay? One of the things we, we, uh, we learn about it from history is that Rome would send their discharged soldiers, from, their discharged soldiers that were done with their military service, to Philippi and give them plots of land. So you can imagine the Roman patriotism in a city like Philippi was probably really great. In, in, in Philippi, there were, there were pagan temples, pagan cults, just like there were in other, in other cities like Ephesus and like Rome. But the most common religion in Philippi was the imperial cult. It was the imperial cult. Now you might wonder, what's the imperial cult? The imperial cult is known for worshiping Caesar as Savior and Lord. Worshiping Caesar as Savior and Lord. You might, you might ha have heard that 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 Christians in the early days were, were pressured to, to offer incense to Caesar, to worship Caesar. And in some cities like Ephesus, you know, the imperial cult was there, but it, it was dwarfed in comparison to the temple of Artemis. But in Philippi, the imperial cult was the most prominent religion. It was all about worship of Caesar. And we're going to see as we look through the book, book of Philippians that that, that backdrop is going to provide a significant uh, uh, backstory in order to understand what Paul's saying. One commentator wrote that to, to not participate in the worship of Caesar, to not participate in the imperial cult, was considered a subversive activity in Philippi. And already framed someone in terms of, of opposing the Philippian nationality. Well, this morning we look in Acts 16, we're going to see here the centrality of the gospel. And that's going to be a major theme in Philippians when we start studying Philippians. But what we're going to see here is the centrality of the gospel. And we're actually going to see many themes from the book of Philippians intersect 
with the beginnings of this church. We're going to see those themes kind of in germinal form here and as we look at how the church began. So look in verse Acts 16, verse 6. That's where we're going to start. Okay, And we're just going to read through this chunk by chunk here and talk about it. The Macedonian call is what is titled in my Bible. It says, they, that is uh, Paul and Timothy and Silas and, and also Luke, probably, some commentators think. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. That's interesting. Take note of that. And when they came up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and, coming, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. By the way, we're going to see that Philippi is a district of Macedonia. Philippi is the leading district of Macedonia we're going to see. You might say um, in terms of it's maybe the capital of, Ma of Macedonia. So there's a, a Macedonian man in, uh, in a dream appearing to Paul, and he says, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days. The first thing we need to observe here is that God... God had a specific agenda for Paul to go to Macedonia. It's not very often that you see that the Holy Spirit blocks somebody from going somewhere, right? We saw they, they tried to go, they were in Phrygia and Galatia. And it says that they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Now that doesn't happen very often. That does not happen very often in the Bible where the Holy Spirit says, no, I, keep moving, keep going along. Okay, And then it happens not once, but twice. They came up to Mysia. They attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Why did the Spirit not allow them? We could, it's not because the Spirit doesn't want them to preach the gospel, right? It's like, the, oh, the Holy Spirit doesn't want them, them to know about Jesus and what he's done. No, 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 that's ridiculous. Of course the Holy Spirit wants them to know. It's because God has an agenda. God has a mission for Philippi. Sending Paul and Timothy to Philippi was a specific direction from God. It was a specific direction from God. Whenever the gospel gets preached somewhere, it's not just happenstance. It shows that God has a heart for that place, and God is directing people to go to that place. The fact that the gospel has been preached here, the, the fact that the gospel has been preached to you, is not some inconsequential happenstance. It shows that God directed somebody by his spirit into your life to preach the gospel. It shows that God was after you. And what we see here is that God is after Philippi. He's sending Paul and Timothy to Philippi to preach the gospel to them. Notice also that in this dream, in this vision that Paul has, there's a man standing there. And, and notice what he says. He says, come over to Macedonia and help us. Come over to Macedonia and help us. If you had a dream and someone was saying, help me, maybe the first question you would ask is, help me with what? Help, what do you need help with? It's kind of vague, right? Do you need medical help? Do you need food? What's going on in your life that you need help? But look at what Paul concludes here. Look at verse 10, the last sentence, concluding from the statement that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. I, this is powerful to me. The, the man says, come help us, and Paul says, the man needs help, and he concludes, he's thinking about this, right? He's thinking about this, and he concludes, this man needs help. The most helpful thing I can do for him is give him the gospel. Do you think like that? What we're going to see is the centrality of the gospel here. It's not, that, it's not that there aren't other legitimate needs that people have, like needs for food, housing, clothing, things like that, need need. You know, what need for a job, things like that. It's not that there aren't other legitimate needs. There are. But Paul sees that the primary need of every person on this fallen earth is the need of the gospel. Do you think about the gospel like that? 
This is a matter of triage. You know what triage is, right? When you find somebody, when you, find, when you, when you come up to a scene and there's an accident, and you got to look around really quickly and decide, what's the most important thing that i got to address first? That's what Paul's doing. Paul's saying, I don't know what help they need. I don't know what's going on in their life. But if I do triage and they die, they'll meet the wrath of God. So the most important thing, the most helpful thing I can do is give him the gospel. Do you think about the gospel like that? Does, does, does preaching the gospel have that kind of priority in your heart and mind, in your actions? Is preaching the gospel the uppermost way that you consider helping people? Because that's people's greatest need. You remember the story of the paralyzed man in Mark chapter, Mark chapter 2, right? They, they bring a paralyzed man to Jesus. And do you remember what Jesus does? You remember what Jesus does? Jesus looks at him and says, Son, take heart. Your sins are forgiven. Now, they didn't bring this man to Jesus to get forgiven. They brought him to Jesus to get healed. But what we see is that Jesus is reorienting their priorities. Son, your most important problem is not that you need healed of your paralysis. Your most important problem is that you need forgiven of your sins. The plague of sin is worse than any other earthly affliction we can experience. And the need for our forgiveness and salvation of our sins is the highest need that there is. So God sends them intentionally to Philippi. The, we see the centrality of the gospel. Let's look now at, at, at verse 12 and 13. It says, from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony, we remained in this city some days, verse 13, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there to be a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. Now, this tells us that there was probably no synagogue in Philippi. Why were they outside the gate? Well, archaeologically, archaeologists have found a gate to the city of Philippi, and on that gate is an inscription that says, no unknown religions allowed. And so these women who, who are wanting to pray, because this is an unknown religion, again, the, the context of that would be against the main religion of Philippi, which is the imperial cult, worship of Caesar. So a, a, a religion where you're praying to a god who is not Caesar would not be allowed in the city. So they had to go outside the city gate, and they found a place of prayer by the river. And they spoke to the women who had come together. I love this. Verse 14. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods. Purple good was a luxury back in that day. This tells us that this woman probably had some significant, um, you know, she had a good job. She made good money probably. But it tells us she was a worshiper of God. Now, it doesn't mean she was a Christian. It means she was probably a Gentile God-fearer who in some way aligned herself with the Jewish people because she saw that Yahweh was the one true God. And even though mainly it was the Jews who worshipped Yahweh, she wanted to join herself with them to worship this one true God. One of the themes we see in Acts is that there are these people who fear God and worship him and want to honor him. And even though they don't know the gospel yet, we see that God is constantly getting the gospel to these people. And even just because, just because they haven't known the gospel, we, we see that God is going to get the gospel to people who sincerely desire to know God and worship him. God's not going to cut them off from the gospel. Like, oh, you sincerely desire to know God and you want to worship him and honor him with your life. Sorry, you don't know Jesus. No, God's going to get the gospel to those people. You see that all throughout, all throughout the book of Acts. You see that with Cornelius. You see that here with Lydia. She was a worshiper of God. She wanted to know the one true God. And look at this. As Paul is preaching, it says, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, in Greek, it's probably literally a believer. If you, if you have judged me to be a believer in the Lord, come to my house and stay 
and she prevailed upon us. <laughs> That's what it says at the end of verse 15. She prevailed upon us. Okay, this is prevailing hospitality, right? When you, when you want to have somebody over and they say no, and then you say uh, no to your no. You're coming over, all right? You ever met somebody like that who just won't let you go? It's like you're coming over for lunch. Get Okay, that's, that's Lydia here, okay? But what we see is that when the gospel, we see the centrality of the gospel, and that Paul, Paul concludes we need to go preach the gospel to them. Paul comes and preaches the gospel, and what do we see? God works. God moves. God doesn't call us to preach the gospel and then do nothing. When we preach the gospel, God works. Now, we don't know the way he's going to work. We don't read that every woman in this prayer meeting came to know Jesus, but one did. One did. And that's enough. You remember the parable, the, 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 lost, the lost sheep, you know, the, the man leaves the 99 to go after the one, and he brings it back on his shoulders rejoicing. Jesus said, so there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than of 99 who need no repentance. One matters. And when you preach the gospel, God is going to work. And what we see here is that God works. And unless God works... Nobody's going to come to know Christ. We see that the Lord had to open her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. The Lord has to work in order for people to receive the gospel. The Lord has to work, and he does work. Praise the Lord that he does do the work when we preach the gospel. Not always, but sometimes. Well, they preach the gospel to Lydia. Lydia becomes the first convert from Europe. And, and we see that immediately after she, gets, she believes, she gets baptized, okay, so she takes the first step of obedience to profess her faith publicly, and then she bears beautiful fruit. God, you can see that God has done a work in her life. This woman of wealth, um, who's the seller of purple goods, she insists that they come to their house and stay with them. She's going to take care of these men who just preach the gospel to her. Hospitality is a good fruit of saving faith. Prevailing hospitality is a good fruit of saving faith. And sometimes this is what we need to do to get fellowship together, amen? We're so busy, we're so tired a lot of times that you got to say, hey, you want to come over? We're having dinner tonight, you want to come over for dinner? Ah, no, come on, man, get over for dinner. Get over to my house. And then you get done with dinner, and it's really, and you had a great time, right? That's, this is one of the ways that the Lord began working in my life when I was in youth group. I went to church in the spring of my senior year of high school with my mom after not having been to church in a long, long time. I went out and sat in my car right after the service when my mom, my mom talked forever and ever with people inside the church, and I'm just sitting there waiting for her. I look out the window, and I see the whole youth group coming out to my car. And so I just look forward and pretend like I didn't see them. And eventually, it's just getting awkward because they're right outside the car. And I'm just like, oh, okay, I can't pretend I didn't see them anymore. I roll down the window, and they invite me to go hang out. They invite me to go to Taco Bell with them, all right? Hang out with them. And I said, no, i got to fill out scholarship applications tonight. And they're like, well, we, we don't have school on Monday, so, yeah, you can come to Taco Bell with us. It's like, what do you say when you just said no, and then they say no to your no? Long story short, I ended up going to Taco Bell with them. Had a great time. I didn't, I didn't come to understand the gospel yet, but I realized that, wow, these, these weird kids in youth group, of which I was the weirdest now, they loved me. They treated me well. And so I kept coming back, and the Lord began to use that desire to hang out with them, that time together that summer, to bring me to the gospel, to know Christ. We see the fruit of prevailing hospitality. Well, let's keep going. Um, now Paul, in verse 16, he takes a step back to what happened as they were on the way to the prayer meeting. It says, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling, okay? This is a, a demon-possessed woman who can tell the future, okay? Not, just because somebody can tell the future doesn't mean they're of God, okay? She, she by a spirit of divination, a, a demon, she could fortune tell, and she brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. Well, verse 17, she's, it says, she followed Paul and us, crying out, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. I mean, she's just walking around. She's outing them everywhere they go. Hey, they're going to proclaim to you the gospel. <laughs> In verse 18, it says, 
This she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus, come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. Sometimes we think Paul's so spiritual that he never got annoyed, but oh, he got annoyed. <laughs> Just give him a demon-possessed slave girl that's following him around for days saying, hey, these men are going to tell you about Jesus. That'll drive Paul crazy. Verse 19, but when her owners, this is, this, is, this is heartbreaking right here, but when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews, probably tapping on some anti-Semitism here. These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates and the magistrates tore the garment off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Okay, here's the third point that we see here. Uh, when we preach the gospel, God's going to work. And when we preach the gospel, we're going to meet opposition. That's what we see happen in Philippi. They met opposition. First, the opposition of the slave girl. It might not seem like opposition because she was telling everyone what they're here to do. But, but, but listen, when you're, when you're here to proclaim a message, you don't want to align yourself with a demon-possessed slave girl, right? That's not good for the message of the gospel. But they also met opposition of the slave girl's owners. Notice... notice when, the, when they cast a demon out of the slave girl, the owners weren't like, wow, praise God that she's finally been healed of this horrible affliction that's been plaguing her whole, her whole life. No, their first response is, there goes all our money. What wickedness. What wickedness. There's way too much of that in the world today. Way too much of that in America there's even way too much of that in the church today. Well, we're not so concerned about the well-being of others as we are about economic prosperity in our own lives. Way too much of that. But they met opposition. They met opposition. You're going to meet opposition when you preach the gospel. Notice, notice the accusation they bring against these men. It says, they advocate customs that are not lawful for us as what? as Romans to accept or practice. This comes back to what I was saying earlier about, about the, the patriotic imperial cult of Philippi. One of the things, now Paul wasn't, Paul wasn't creating a ruckus. He just cast out a demon girl. But we see that, that Paul's proclamation of the gospel, his mission in Philippi was, was butting up against greed and sin. And whenever we proclaim the gospel, our gospel is also going to push back on greed and sin. It's going to make people angry. But I think there's something more to this here. Um, with the worship of Caesar, with the worship of Caesar, there was something inherent in the Christian gospel that, that, that diametrically opposed so many of the things that Caesar proclaimed. Now, you might not know this. There was the gospel of Jesus Christ, but there was also the gospel of Caesar Augustus. The Greek word for gospel is euangelion. And the same word is used of the gospel of Caesar. There's the euangelion of, of Jesus Christ, and there's the euangelion of Caesar Augustus. And to go in saying, hey, we're proclaiming to you the gospel, the good news, those who worship Caesar are, are hearing that word. Wait, there's, there's another gospel? There's another gospel that's not related to Caesar? Don't you see how? Don't you see why where this guy's getting the saying that they're they're advocating customs that go against uh, uh, us as Romans? What what we are about? So there's there's a, the gospel of Caesar Augustus is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you know that we have inscriptions where Caesar was called Savior and Lord, Kyrios, the exact same word that was used of Jesus Christ. Jesus is Savior and Lord. In the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, it was said that there is salvation under no other name than Caesar. Why does that sound familiar to us? Because Peter in Acts 4, 
hijacks that and say, there is salvation by no other name under heaven than Jesus Christ. The Pax Romana was called the peace of Rome. But what we're going to see in Philippians 4, 6 is that Paul promises a different peace. The peace of God in Christ Jesus is what Paul promises in Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. You see how the, the very language of the Christian gospel is, is, is offensive to the concepts and worship of Caesar. To, because to say Jesus is Lord, to say, to say the gospel of Jesus Christ is the, is the true gospel, to say the name of Jesus is the only name under heaven by which men are saved, is to inherently deny the truthfulness of the euangelion of Caesar, the gospel of Caesar. It's to deny that Caesar is Lord. It's to deny that Caesar provides salvation. It's to deny that the peace of Rome is the true peace that's offered. And so these, these men, they get mad because their money is being taken away, but they frame they, their accusation in political terms, just like the Jews did with who? Jesus. In John, John 19, we saw that. The Jews cast their accusation against Jesus in political terms. He makes himself a king in opposition to Caesar. When you preach the gospel, you're going to face opposition. This, this contrast between the, the gospel of Caesar and the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to be a significant theme as we run through Philippians. We're going to see that, that there's a significant anti-imperial slant, as some authors say, to what Paul writes in Philippians. Because he knows if he's going to use this language, he's got to help these people understand that Caesar is not Savior and Lord. Caesar does not bring you ultimate good news. Jesus does. And when we proclaim the Christian gospel, we're going to face opposition because we're going to proclaim Jesus as Savior and Lord when, when the people around us want to look to other things as Savior and Lord. What you're doing when you proclaim Jesus is you're smashing their idols. You're saying your idols, the things that you've looked to for security, for peace, for happiness, for hope, they are nothing. And people are going to get offended by that. People are going to get offended by that. We see the gospel is central. We see that God works when we proclaim the gospel. We see that we face opposition when we proclaim the gospel. Now look at verse 25. I love this. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. So they're in prison, and it's midnight, and they're singing hymns and praying. And it, and it says the prisoners were listening to them. Why is that? People pay attention to how you suffer. Suffering is, is one of the most challenging things that we face in this world, but people pay attention to how you suffer. And we see that Paul and Silas, they're in prison, but it's like they're, it's like they're, not, they're not missing a beat on worshiping God. They're singing in their suffering. Do you sing in your suffering? People pay attention to how you suffer. It says specifically the prisoners were listening to them. The prisoners were struck by this, is the sense. Well, it says, suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaking, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners escaped. He's going to kill himself because if the prisoners escape on his watch, he's going to be the one put to death. So he, he, he's about to kill himself. Verse 29 but Paul cried out with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. Okay. When we preach the gospel, we are going to face opposition but listen to this, the opposition usually provides more opportunities to preach the gospel. Don't despise the opposition that you face for being a Christian. The opposition is often the pathway that leads to greater opportunity. Paul's in prison, and all the prisoners in this place are hearing the, are hearing the gospel through their prayers and through their singing. All right? First they shared the gospel at a prayer meeting. Now they're having a prison ministry. Everyone's hearing the gospel, and the very jailer himself 
through an earthquake, through a providential earthquake, comes in and falls down before these prisoners and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? This is beautiful, amen? This is beautiful. And so it's midnight. It's still the middle of the night here. And it says, they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And so here's what happened here. He, the prisoner brings these prisoners, or, or the jailer brings these prisoners back to his house. I mean, that's just going to go well if you're a jailer, right? Hey, I met these guys in prison, and now they're staying with us tonight because, you know, we just had an earthquake and the, and the prison's opened. And so now these prisoners, Paul and Silas, are not only proclaiming the gospel to the jailer, but to the whole household. Verse 33, he took them that same hour of the night. He took them that same hour of the night. So it's still midnight, maybe one in the morning by now. He took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Man, I want to see something like this happen. Baptisms at one in the morning because the whole family just heard the gospel and received Christ. That's awesome. But notice, but notice what else he did. It says he washed their wounds that very night. So it's one in the morning. This jailer just received Christ. He's about to get baptized. And here he is washing the wounds of the prisoners. God's done a work here. God has done a great work here. We saw with Lydia that she professed faith, and immediately there was beautiful fruit of her faith. There was prevailing hospitality. Well, again, here we see a jailer who's probably become cold and hard, and jailers are um, kind of known for treating their prisoners with cruelty and disregard, right? And yet this jailer has just received Christ, and we see there is a beautiful, there's some beautiful fruit that his faith is bearing. Faith, belief in Jesus, always, always, always bears fruit. We're not saved by the fruit. We're saved by the faith in Jesus. We're saved by trusting in Jesus alone. But that changes us, and it bears fruit. We see that here. A, a hardened jailer washing the wounds of his prisoners. That's beautiful. But it says, then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. Again, that's, that's fruit. He's bearing fruit. He's caring for these men. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he has believed in God. Listen, brothers and sisters, if you have believed in Jesus Christ, if you believed in him, you need to rejoice in that. Sometimes we lose that when we're young Christians. Or sometimes we lose that when we've been in the faith for some time. We forget what it was to not be a Christian, to not have hope, to not believe. And we forget what great joy we ought to have from just the simple fact of, wow, I have a Savior. I have a Savior who loves me. I have a God who knows me and cares for me. I have a hope beyond this world. Do you rejoice in your salvation? Do you rejoice that you've believed? We're going to see in the book of Philippians that one of the main themes is that of rejoicing in the Lord. Let's keep going here. Verse 35, but when it was day, the magistrates sent, sent the police saying, let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. <laughs> but Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison. Notice he just called himself a Roman citizen. That's a big deal in Philippi. And they have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No, let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. Roman citizens in, in a Roman colony had great rights. They enjoyed great privileges. Roman citizens in Philippi would go without the brutal Roman tax that we know so well of from the Gospels. Places like Jerusalem were taxed heavily by the Romans. That's why being a tax collector was such a wicked thing to the Jews. Roman citizens were spared from that tax. They enjoyed great architecture. They enjoyed the great aspects of Roman culture. They enjoyed due process in court, like other, like, like other people, who, other cities and countries that were ruled by the Romans did not enjoy. Well, they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens, so they came and apologized to them. And they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So when they went out of the prison they, and, and visited Lydia, and when they, when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. What we see here is 
is that the gospel vindicated. Okay? And what's interesting here is that when, when the prison, when the, when the earthquake shook the prison and opened all the gates, Paul, Paul knew it was not right for him to be in prison. Right? We, we're tracking with that, right? We see that here from the way the story ends, that he knew it was not right for him to be in prison. But did he run off and escape because it was his right to be a free man? No, he did not. He laid down his rights for the sake of advancing the gospel and protecting the life of the jailer who would have been put to death. And yet, does that always mean Paul laid down his rights as a citizen? No, because at the end of this chapter, he, he stands up for his rights and he says, hey, I'm a Roman citizen. I deserve due process in court. You had me beaten publicly and now you're trying to throw me out secretly. I have rights, guys. Why does, but what motivates him in each case? His motivation for laying down his rights and his motivation for holding to his rights is the same in both cases. It's the advance of the gospel. He lays down his rights to advance the gospel. But now that he's about to be thrown out of Philippi, what, what kind of message, what, if, if, he, if he has been treated as a criminal in Philippi and publicly beaten, and they're saying, this man who's a Christian is a criminal, he's a wicked man, we're going to beat him and throw him into prison, and then they throw him out secretly, there's no chance for the people of the city to publicly see, oh wait, this is a respectable man, he's a Roman citizen. The gospel There's no chance for them to see the gospel uh, shown to be credible. And so right now the gospel has been blandished. The gospel has received a black eye. The gospel has lost credibility because of the way the magistrates have treated these men. And so for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the gospel to, to not have a black eye in Philippi so that the gospel continue to grow, so that the church can continue to grow, Paul says, I'm going to stand up for my rights right now. I'm going to stand up for my rights so that they see that I was treated wrongly. And so ultimately that they see that the gospel is not, the gospel does not lose credibility. Now we as Americans need to think, need to think carefully about these things, right? Because we do have rights in a country. But sometimes you need to shut up and lay your rights down for the sake of the gospel. And sometimes you need to open your mouth and speak and hold to your rights for the sake of the gospel. Do you have the discernment to know the difference? The key thing is what motivated Paul. What motivated Paul is not, they're stepping on my rights, they're trampling on my rights. That's not the key thing. The key thing is, how does this affect the gospel? How does this affect the witness of the gospel? How does this affect the witness of the church? Now, praise the Lord for rights. But the gospel is more important than our rights, amen? We see that Paul stood up for his rights so that the gospel would be vindicated, so that the gospel would continue to go forth. Do you think about your rights like that? The gospel is more important than our rights. And I will gladly lay my rights down for the sake of the gospel, and I will gladly hold to my rights for the sake of the gospel. Well, this is how the church in Philippi began it's a beautiful thing. We've got Lydia and her family. A she's from Thyatira. She's a foreigner in Philippi. We've got the slave girl who, you know, we don't know for sure if she became a Christian, but the demons were cast out of her, so she might have become a Christian. And we've got the jailer's family. <laughs> this is the church. Now let's hold hands and sing kumbaya. This is a weird group of people gathering together for the sake of the gospel, Amen. This is church. <laughs> church gathers people that might have no other reason to gather together. I've become friends with people I would have never become friends with if it wasn't for the sake of the gospel. This week, I was sitting in my front yard cutting down my pine tree with a man from Hong Kong named Ming. Now, to the people in our neighborhood, that was probably a strange sight. It's like, there's a guy from Hong Kong over there who's 6'3", and there's this short white guy, and they're cutting down a tree together. That's the church. The church is meant to be a, a witness to the rest of the world that, that people from different cultural backgrounds, from different ethnic backgrounds, can love each other and be unified around a central message when the rest of the world is divided. 
That's the church. We love it. It's glorious. It's awesome. This is how the church began. And Paul, Paul was only there for a couple days, and then he's off. And, and yet we know that Christianity in Philip, Philippi flourished over time. The church grew. Why? Because Paul was there, constantly preaching the gospel, doing all the work for them? No, because this ordinary group of ragtag believers continued to proclaim the gospel. The church is not going to grow unless ordinary believers proclaim the gospel. The pastors don't have enough time, don't have enough pastors to go proclaim the gospel to the neighborhood, to the city. It's just impossible. Christianity will not grow if it's left to the pastors. You've got work to do, church. I've got work to do, and you've got work to do. I'm called to share the gospel just like all of you are called to share the gospel. But listen, the church is not going to grow unless ordinary ragtag believers are going to their neighbors, are going to their coworkers, preaching the gospel, building relationships. That's how churches grow. It's not by us having a cool, super cool service here. Sending out flyers to the neighborhoods, you know, some churches do that. And some churches grow that way. But I would rather grow by seeing each of you take steps of faithfulness to share the gospel with your neighbors and then invite them to church. That's the way churches have always grown. Let's not sidestep that basic act of faithfulness. And look for other ways to do what the church has always been called to do, is just share the gospel. That's how the church in Philippi began. That's how all churches begin. That's how churches grow. Now, at this point, I just want to read through the letter of Philippians together. I did it this week. It's not going to take us half an hour. It's going to take us... 12 minutes, 14 minutes maybe. Okay? So take a breath. But we're just going to read through the whole book of Philippians together. And I think this is important for us because it's, it's going to lay a foundation at, for the rest of the summer. Sometimes when you start teaching through a book, but nobody has, nobody's ever read that book or hasn't read it in a while, just the things don't have the context they should have as if you've already read through it. So I just want to read through it and then as we start teaching through it each week, you'll start, to, you'll start to remember, oh, Paul says this. That's how it relates to the big picture of what Paul's saying in Philippians. Now, some big themes in Philippians here. The theme of joy is a big one. You see the word gladness, joy, rejoice about 15 or 16 times in the book of Philippians. It's glorious. It's awesome. We see the theme of the gospel. Paul uses the word gospel nine times in this letter. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but, but the only other book written by Paul, where, where the word gospel is used that many times is the book of Romans. The book of Romans has 16 chapters. Philippians has four chapters. Every other time, 1 Corinthians, Paul uses the word gospel eight times. You can see why the theme of gospel in Philippians is a big deal. Nine times in four chapters. More times, more often than any other book that Paul, any other letter that Paul's written. We're going to th see the theme of gospel community in the letter of Philippians. We're going to see that they, they were partnered in the gospel. They were committed to one another. Paul wants them to be striving side by side for the sake of the gospel. He wants them to be humble and unified. We're going to see the theme of suffering. Their suffering, just as Paul suffered when he was in Philippi the first time. We're going to see the suffering of Jesus. And we're going to see a big theme is going to be the anti-imperial polemic. That much of what Paul says is contrasted with the gospel of Rome, the peace of Rome. Okay, there's just a little preview of some of the themes we're going to see. Watch for them as we read. You ready? Here we go. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion 
at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or or an absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I may be cheered by news of you, For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know, Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will also come. I thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all, And has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God 
had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss for the sake, or I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us, for many of whom... I have often told you, and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemy of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame, with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, Stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Yodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I also ask you, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet, it was kind of you to share in my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit.
Wow, that was awesome. I got a lot out of that just reading it again. Let's take communion together and let's just celebrate the good news of the gospel. Let's spend a few moments just confessing your sins to the Lord, confessing, um, even just looking at the preview of themes, even having just read through that, I'm confident that the Holy Spirit touched your heart about some things that maybe need to grow in your life, some sins that you've maybe seen in your life. And so just spend time confessing those to, to the Lord, and then we'll, we'll take communion together, assuring ourselves of the effective body and blood of Jesus Christ shed for our sins. time if you want to get up and meet the elements. take these elements together in faith, trusting not in, in this cup, but trusting in what this cup reminds us of and what it represents, the, the body of, of Jesus that was broken, bearing our sins, the blood of Jesus that was poured out to wash us from our sins. Let's take the bread together. This is his body broken for us. This is his blood poured out for the forgiveness of our trespasses. Lord Jesus, we just praise you. We give you all the glory. Lord, that you, the gospel, you sent somebody to preach the gospel to us out of your love for us. Just like you opened Lydia's heart, Lord, you opened our heart to respond to the gospel. And, 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 Lord, you tell us that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and if you hadn't opened our heart, we would have stared blindly at the glorious gospel and never responded. Lord, thank you for the work that you've done. Jesus, thank you for bearing our sin. Thank you that we are forgiven and saved. Lord, let us be a church that rejoices in the good news week after week, who is motivated by the advancement of the gospel in all of our dealings, Lord. Lord Jesus, be pleased with us as a church. Lord, we want to live for you. We want to honor you, Lord. And we, we most of all want to trust you and you alone, not ourselves. Lord, you are our righteousness. You're our hope. You're our salvation. Nothing we can do adds to it, Lord. It's in your name. Everyone said amen. that the gospel is 
the best news. And Paul said, this is what I wanted to learn first and teach first, that Christ died and was buried and rose again. And then he appeared to more than 500. That is the good news. That is the gospel that we give to, to the nations. So as we sing and close this, sing with your voices. May the peoples <laughs> praise you. We pray that the gospel goes out to all here in Elizabeth and to the world. So let's sing this together. You have called the sound of darkness into your glorious light that we may sing the wonders of the to our strife with boundless love and deepest joy with endless love. Let's praise him together. May the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad. All your blessing comes that we may pray. song to end with. Wow. May the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad. Wow. Hear the benediction. The last verse of Philippians. And I just hear this 
The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Okay? If you need prayer this morning, the elders will be up front, the ones that don't have COVID. Um, and otherwise, we're going to be taking chairs downstairs into the basement, but don't go through the stairwell. Okay, go around. It'll be a workout for your biceps. It'll be good. All right. Thank you, worship team, and you're dismissed.